Today you're going to hear uh, the 2019 edition of the Marburg Memorial Lecture. The Marburg Lecture Series is named in honor of the late Theodore Marburg, who was a longtime member of the Economics Department here at Marquette University. The goal of the Marburg Memorial Lecture is to provide a forum for discussion of moral, philosophical, and social dimensions of economic issues, as well as continue Professor Marburg's commitment to the use of economic aspects of peace and justice. The Marburg Lecture is made possible by the generosity of the Marburg family and through the support of the Center for Applied Economics. The Marburg Lecture is generally held every fall semester. Next, I'd like to give a very special welcome to uh, a, a large number of public officials that we have from both Milwaukee City and Milwaukee County. And if you would please, if you could please stand, we'd like to acknowledge you. Including the sheriff. If you'll take a look at the uh, screens, the large screens you see in the corners, you'll notice that um, we have two spring events here at the College of Business Administration. You'll notice the first is held in January, and that is our economic roundtable, which will be hosted by the executive and residents of the College of Business, Mr. Tim Hanley. And this year, we will have Dan Fuss and Mary Ellen Stanick on the stage. And uh, both of those were finalists for the annual Morningstar Award for Money Manager of the Year. Uh, they were two finalists out of five nationwide. So we're very proud to have two of the five as alumni of our college. And indeed, Dan Fuss won the award. Next, we have in March our Business Leaders Forum. This year, we'll have Mr. Jim Snee, who is the CEO of Hormel Corporation and a parent of a Marquette student. So please mark those on your calendar. I'd also like to look very far out and tell you that next October, we will have our Marburg Memorial Lecture, and next year it will be Dr. Eric Rosengren, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. He's quite a disruptor in the uh, FOMC space, so he should be very entertaining as well. Now, an event like this of the size that we have today is not possible without some uh, very heavy lifting and, and behind the scenes work. And so I'd like to acknowledge a few people and first uh, apologize for those people I'm sure I have overlooked. So first, I'd like to acknowledge our event and co communication coordinator, Megan Withoff, our director of external relations, John Knapp, our technology specialist, Drew Stathouse, the staff of our uh, Office of Marketing Communications here at Marquette Uni University, especially Chris Stolarski, and uh, the economics department administrative assistant, Amy Connolly. If you would please uh, acknowledge them with applause. The Marburg Lecture is a lecture that is hosted every year by the Economics Department. And of course, all of the members in the department put in a, a lot of work to bring this event about every year, especially those folks that are members of the committee. I would like to acknowledge one person in, in particular who is the chair of the committee and, and brought Dr. Duflo here today, and that is Dr. Catherine Wagner. If Catherine, if you would stand, I'd appreciate it. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the provost of Marquette University, Dr. Kimo Ayun. You know, when I think of what it means to be at a university, uh, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing, about stimulating the mind, about thinking about society and how we can make it better, and that's completely consistent with what it means to be a Catholic Jesuit institution. It is my great privilege uh, today to be able to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Esther Duflo, she is Abdul Latif Jamil, Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at MIT. Interesting thing is they thought she was from IT in another conversation that I had on my way here, but we said it's the other IT, the M1. She is the co-founder and director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, also known as JPAL, uh, and where their mission is to reduce poverty through evidence-informed policies, and that's exactly what we need today. Her research focuses on understanding the economic lives of the poor with the aim to help evaluate and design social policies in a variety of fields, including health, education, financial inclusion, environment, and governance. 
She is author of two very important books. Uh, the first in 2011, Poor Economics, A Radical Rethinking of the Way to Flight Global Poverty. In her most recent book, 2019, Good Economics for Hard Times, and she's going to be speaking on that today. Uh, the book uses economic research to explain how to rethink about and think about worldwide large-scale problems such as immigration and inequality, globalization and technological disruption, slowing growth, and accelerating climate change. She prevent, presents a convincing argument for evidence-based interventions centered on the research for real-life situations towards a society built on compassion and respect. She is a winner of numerous awards, and I have a long list of them. Uh, but she's won a Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences with Abhijit Banerjee and Michael Kramer. And pretty much when you win a Nobel Prize, you don't need to list any of the other awards. So I'm going to stop right there. And at this point, welcome to the stage, Dr. DeFlo. What I'm going to do today is to try to tell you a little bit about this new uh, book that we just completed. It's not very common in uh, economics lecture to read from one's work, uh, but it's more common when you present a book. So I thought I would cut the, I would compromise by reading you a very, very small piece of the book. And it's the very beginning of the book. And I think it will maybe help uh, kind of set the stage of uh, why we wrote this book, which in a way is a little bit different from what we normally do and in particular, the research that led to the Nobel Prize. So you might be wondering what we are doing moving from global poverty, which is our line of business, our main line of business, and, and talk about immigration or trade. 10 years ago, we wrote a book about the work we do. To our surprise, it found an audience. We were flattered, but it was clear to us that we were done. Economists do not really write books. List of all the books that human beings can read. <laughs> we did it, and somehow we got away with it. It was time to go back to what we normally do, which is to write and publish research papers. Which is what we were doing while the dawn lights of the early Obama years gave way to the psychedelic madness of Brexit, the yellow vests, and the wall, and strutting dictators, or their elected equivalent, replaced the confu confused optimism of the Arab Spring. Inequality is exploding. Environmental catastrophes and global policy disasters loom, but we are left with little more than platitudes to confront them with. We wrote this book to hold on to hope, to tell ourselves the story of what went wrong and why, but also as a reminder of all that has gone right, a book as much about the problems as about how our world can be put back together as long as we are honest with the diagnosis a book about where economics policy has failed, where ideology has blinded us, where we have missed the obvious, but also a book about where and why good economics is useful, especially in today's world. So that tells you why we decided to take some time to uh, focus, in a sense, on the research of others uh, and other economists, and to give a voice to a profession that is much more diverse and uh, less ideological in a way than what reading the news might lead you to believe. So one of the reasons why we think economics needs to come back is that uh, most issues that are important today in our world are core economic issues. For Brexit, of course, in the UK, trade policy, immigration, and what it's going to do to people's wages, economic growth and whether it can come back or whether it's going to be at these uh, lower rates, inequality, social policy, climate change. Those are not issues that are only issues of economics, but those are issues that have a lot of economic content in them. And yet, it doesn't seem that we hear that much of an economist voice in the policy conversation. And to the extent we do hear a voice, it doesn't look like anybody is really listening to that voice. Uh, in fact, we have many colleagues, for example, at the LSE, and they were really uh, up in arms in trying to talk about Brexit before the Brexit election. Nobody, they were really depressed because nobody was listening to them. And they were right, nobody was listening to them because economists as a profession have really lost a lot of their credibility. 
So this is a poll that was taken in the UK about, by uh, YouGov in 2017, which asked people uh, what, uh, who they trust about their own field of expertise. So the least trusted people are politicians, with apologies for the politicians in the room. Uh, local MP is another form of politician. But then third from the bottom come economists. <laughs> 25% of people trust economists about economics, so it's not about uh, dating or, uh, or, the, uh, or in the, like football prediction. Uh, this is about half of uh, weather forecasters, which is to sort of set, set the benchmark uh, where it needs to be. And that's not just the UK. Uh, we actually replicated this poll in the US in the fall of 2018. With a, sample, uh, with a survey we conducted with 10,000 people. And we found exactly the same thing, that we were second to bottom after the politician. And only 25% of people reported trust, trusting economies, economists about economics. And in fact, that uh, translates into uh, people uh, having very different views about many economic issues that economists have. Uh, one way that we, uh, can, we should evidence for that is in that same survey of 10,000 people, we ask people their view, our respondents, uh, their view about uh, some core economic issues. And the way we framed the question was exactly in the same way that the University of Chicago phrases it when it, it, it pulls its roster of economics experts. So the University of Chicago uh, Business School, the Booth School of Business, runs a poll every now and then. I think they have about 35 to 50 economists on it at top institutions over the country. And I ask them what they think of, about, about various issues. We took about 12 of those questions, and we asked the same exact questions to our respondents, which are representative of the US public. So here's the first question, one example. Uh, so the question that was asked, and we asked the same question to our, our respondents, imposing new US tariffs on steel and aluminum will improve American well-being. So if you ask our respondents, uh, about 32% uh, uh, disagree with that, uh, 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 sorry, about 32% agree with that statement. And then I'm going to show you the expert in a minute, except I have shown you the expert. None of the economists, zero, think that it would. <laughs> so that's one kind of sharp disagreement between the public and the economists. I'm not saying who is right, but uh, there is clearly a gap. Uh, migration is another uh, sector where there is a big gap between people's uh, opinion and what economists believe. So again, for, in the IGM Paul, uh, the question was asked, the, Amer the average American citizen would be better off if a large number of low-skilled foreign workers were legally allowed to enter the US every year. Um, about f more than half of people agree or strongly agree with this statement among economists. Only 9% actually disagree. The other are uncertain. So among economists, not only we don't think there is too much migration now, but most economists think that it would be better to have more. <laughs> But of course, that's not the view of migration that exists in this country, or this is actually the UK, where they show that 44% of Britain in 2016 thought that the current migration level were much too high. And another 26% thought it was too high. So clearly, they didn't think that adding a, vast, a large number of them would be an improvement. So that's another place where people disagree. So one reason why people might disagree with economists is just because the wisdom of economists, uh, such as it is, stays inside academia and people don't talk. So they never really get to know what we think as a profession. But that's actually not the case. And uh, that's shown in, in uh, this experiment, uh, which I'm illustrating by this picture from the Yellow Vest movement in, in France. So the Yellow Vest movement in France, which was a series of demonstrations that took place every Saturday for weeks on end, was started by an attempt to uh, impose a carbon tax and therefore increase the price on gasoline. So people were very upset ag uh, against that. And that generally reflects the fact that even when people think about what could be done to address climate change, 
Economists tend to think that the way you do it is by putting a price on carbon and having a carbon tax. That's the one tax that you know, we can tolerate. But people think that uh, it would be much better to have caps on what, uh, for example, cars can emit or something like that. So people think that there should be regulation that sets limits on the available, uh, allowable quantity. Whereas economists think that we should have prices and then people will adjust around these prices and that's going to be so much better. And so that's an illustration of people disagreeing with carbon tax. It says money for climate change is in fiscal paradise, uh, not in the pocket of the proletariat. So that also tells you why I think people disagree with the carbon tax. They think the incidence is on them and that they won't be compensated by other transfer. And in, in an experiment, uh, Luis Zingales and Paula Sapienza at Chicago um, first asked people this question. And most people told them that regulation would be better than a price, uh, that would be better than a carbon tax. And then they tell them, oh, but you know, most economists think that the carbon tax would be better. And then people say, thank you very much. And then they ask them if their price changed, their idea changed, and nobody's opinion changes. So it is not because people don't know it's what economists might think. It's because they don't agree. Maybe they don't share the premise. Uh, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but they don't agree. So it's not a matter of you know, just giving our wisdom without uh, an effort to explain how we got there. Uh, there is not going to be a persuasion effort. In the same way, by the way, by just pe giving people facts without an explanation of what these facts mean is also not particularly helpful. So why is it that people distrust economists uh, so much? Well, one of the reasons is that uh, the, the profession has a little bit painted itself into a corner by letting some people represent economists who are not really like your typical academic economist. So the person who is typically an economist on television is a chief economist of a bank who is surely a perfectly respectable human being doing their job but necessarily represent the interest of this bank and more generally of banks, let's say. And therefore, is perceived as having a stake in the system the way it is. Another type of economist you're seeing is people, or when economists come out, is to make predictions about what's going to happen to the economy. And we are really, really, really very bad at prediction. And not because we are incompetent, but because it's very, very difficult to predict what's going to happen because the systems are so complex that it's not that we have very good handle on it. So for example, the IMF, which has a big uh, uh, department which is in charge of making prediction about what's going to happen to the economy, uh, tries to do that. And this is a, a, a sort of mischievous gr graph from The Economist magazine, where they're looking at the prediction error that the IMF makes on average. So over these periods, the countries they're looking at, the average growth rate over the next year is about 4%. And when you compute, you compute the prediction error at 21 months, it's, three, it's almost 3%, which is, a whole, you know, which is a large error on average. Of course, it gets a little bit better as you come closer, but even at three months, they are still at 1.5% uh, error. Uh, and then what the economists did is that they made their own predictions. One is just pick a random number between minus 2 and 10. And that's worse than what the IMF does. Uh, the prediction error is about 4%, but it's not so much worse. Or pick just constant 4% growth rate for every country, any period. And that's about as good as uh, the IMF prediction. Or just pick whatever growth was last year, and that's even a little bit better. Uh, so just as good as what the IMF predicts. So if that's how good we are at forecasting, then if most people think that economists should forecast what's going to happen to the stock market or to the economy, no wonder they think we're pretty lousy at what we are doing. So there is a funny quote here from John Kenneth Galbraith who said, the only function of economist forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. <laughs> but in fact, most of economics is not at all about forecasting. Uh, it's about 
uh, studying uh, in much more detail how people respond to the environment around them, how they process information, how they respond to incentive, how different agents interact with each other. It's studying social policy, it's studying poverty. It's not at all about forecasting economic growth. But those voices are typically very quiet and they don't really come out. So that uh, we've sort of abandoned our right to our, 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 our pretense to have a space in the public conversation. And that's very unfortunate because that means the pub it has contributed to the fact that the public conversation is not nearly as rich as it could be. Uh, as you all know, the country is becoming extremely polarized. It's enough for me to know uh, three things about you and I can predict most of your opinion on most things. And that doesn't seem right. Uh, it seems that there should be much more diversity in people's opinion, uh, depending on what, where the facts takes you and the interpretation of these facts. And that doesn't seem right, and that has contributed, I think, to a vicious circle where we have issues discussing with each other on policy and politics, and therefore we don't solve the problem, and therefore people become even angrier, and therefore we discuss even less. So the idea of this book is to kind of do our little part and say, well, let's bring back some this, you know, peaceful, slow economic discourse in this conversation, explain what we think the professions know. So it's not mainly a book about our own research. It's mainly a book that is trying to give voice to a profession and to where we see the consensus, not only on some phenomenon, but also on the explanations for this phenomenon. And then, of course, there is a bit of our own, own opinion in the book. But I think it's pretty clear when this becomes us versus this was the facts and the mechanism that led us there. And hopefully, people will read it and form their own views. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is not talk to you chapter by chapter what the book does, but instead extract four lessons that uh, we realized after writing the whole book were kind of all over the teams. So the, the, the book is organized by chapter. There's one chapter on immigration, one chapter on trade, and one chapter on climate, and so on and so forth. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, some lessons that are transversal to all these teams. The first one uh, is that uh, incentives are overrated, or rather, financial incentives are overrated. So it is really a key premise of economists that people respond mainly, if not only, to purely economic incentives, like the wage rate or the wage rate minus the taxes. Not only it's a key premise of economists, but it's one of the key premises of economists that are really permeated the way that we make economic policies. That people are very, very responsive to the economic, to, what's, you know, what, to their pocketbooks. And that has a number of consequences. One is, for example, uh, we live under the idea that they would be very sensitive to tax rates, and so if tax rates went up, they would stop working. And the second is that they're also very sensitive to the generosity of the welfare system. So if the welfare system was too generous, the poor would stop working because they wouldn't have an incentive to work to survive. So it turns out from the evidence that both of these uh, premises are wrong. So let me start with the poor. Um, so this is from a, a graph from a paper called uh, Debunking the Stereotype of the we Lazy Welfare Recipient. And what it's looking at is a series of experiments run uh, uh, around the world where people were essentially given free money. Usually not completely free, it's money in exchange of taking your kids to school and uh, uh, getting them immunization shots and some such, but it's not dependent on your working. So if people were lazy, then once they have this money, which is often significant sums of money, then they should stop working. And these programs were evaluated in randomized control trials such that there is a control group and a treatment group that are exactly comparable. And you can see here the control group in gray and the treatment group in red. So the treatment are the people who got the money and the gray are the people who didn't. And you can see that the bars, country after country after countries, are exactly of the same height. They are as likely to have worked last week, and they, are, they work just the same number of hours per week. So this more generous welfare has not discouraged them from working. So you might be wondering whether this is just like these poor countries, and it would be different in the US. 
But in fact, it is something which the economic profession should have known for a, quite a long time, and we kept a little secret. Because one of the first ever randomized control trial in social policy, probably the first, was done in the US on uh, the negative income tax experiment uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. And the idea was to guarantee people an income and slowly tax it away as they were making more money. That means that the people who benefited from the program, not only they didn't really need to work because they were guaranteed a minimum income, but they had a strong disincentive to work because they lost about 50 cents for any dollar that they made. So it's like a tax rate of 50% for any dollar they made. So there was worries that that type of program would discourage people from working. So this was evaluated in a, in a series of randomized control trials. And the finding of all of those is that there was almost no impact on labor supply. So people did not stop working or did not work less, not only as their financial security was arranged, but also as work paid less for them. So we should have known that, but somehow we didn't really take on board, and also policymakers didn't take on board either the lessons from this experiment, and continue to try to work on you know, a welfare system that is not going to discourage people from working. Interestingly, people know about themselves a good self-knowledge that they are not, that in fact they are not that sensitive to financial incentives. So in our survey, we did a, a little experiment where we asked half of the people random, randomly selected would you, a, a series of questions. For example, if there was a, a, a basic income, guaranteed basic income of $13,000 that has been suggested by some presidential candidate, would you work less or would you stop looking for work? And most people, this is the, their own response is in gray, only about 10% of people said that they would stop working or looking for work or they would work less. Likewise, if uh, we are, they're asking whether a Medicare, a Medicare system without requ work requirement, does that discourage you from working? And people say, no, no, it doesn't discourage me from working. And then if taxes were higher, would you quit working or would you work less? And again, most of the blue points are, are to the left. People are not very, don't, do not say that they would work less or they would stop working. But then when they asked about other people, they said, oh yes, those other people, they would, uh, they would stop working. So if there was a UBI, I would not stop working, but 50% of our respondents think that other people would stop working, and so on and so forth. They think Medicare, the Medicare without work requirement really discourages other people from finding work. So there is a disconnect between what people know about themselves, which is more closely aligned to uh, the truth, it turns out, and what they believe about other people, which is more closely aligned to the myth that economists have perpetuated. The second lesson, and that's related question to, uh, lesson to this one, is that the, the economy is sticky. So what does sticky mean? It's the opposite of something that is fluid, where resources go to their best use, where when there is a shock somewhere and people lose their job, they pick up and they go. In reality, people do not pick up and go. Uh, in fact, we asked our people uh, in, the, in, in this graph as well, we asked people who are currently unemployed, if there was a job available 200 miles away, would you move to take it? And you can see that, uh, a little less than a third would say, yes, I would move to take a job that's 200 miles away. And again, when they asked about other people, they said, yes, they should move to take the job, but I will not move. So this is a really low number, the people who are currently unemployed, willing to move uh, to, uh, or reporting that they would be willing to move for a job. And this really corresponds to a big uh, shift in US society over the last few decades where people are just much, much less mobile geographically than we think they are. And they are much, much less mobile geographically than they used to be. So if you look at county to county mobility, inter-county mobility in the past year, this is figure from the census, you're looking at the red bar uh, on the 2016 graph, shows you that 3.9% of people moved from one county to another one 
uh, in, the, in the year 2016. But that's not a very large number. It's a quite small number. Even, even within county, only 7% of people move within their own county. And if you compare that to 1948, those bars were about twice as high in 1948. So the mobility within the US has declined uh, to about half of what it was half a century ago. And a lot of this decline has actually happened in the, 19, in the 1990 and 2000, precisely when some of the regions got so hit by geographically clustered shock, for example, the trade shock uh, uh, with the competition with China. So this fact that people aren't moving, it's something that is, I think, essential to understand a lot of what is happening in the US today. It's also essential to understand differently how we think about migration. Because in this, so people completely overestimate the mobility of other people, both within the US and across borders. So people have the uh, belief that if borders were open, there would immediately be like a flood of people who would come to this country or come to Europe because the conditions here are so much better than they are there. But the reality is that it's even harder to move across borders. So migration flows are actually remarkably low given the difference in, in standard of living. And when you see large migration flow, it is usually not in response to difference in standard of living. It is in response to some major shock in the countries, in the sending countries, like the war in Syria or uh, violence in Central America, for example. People aren't moved to migrate here for the most part because of the promise of a better economic life. There are exceptions, of course. We tend to be super entrepreneurial and who become the entrepreneurs that make the rest of us tick. So for example, in, in Europe, within the European community, there is no restriction to migration. And when Greece was hit by an amazingly strong uh, economic crisis, the Greeks just stayed in place. They didn't move. Something like 60,000 people Greek moved, and everyone else stayed even though their standard of living had been collapsed. So first, other people stay home, both inside countries and across countries. This is something that in development we sort of always known because the big question in development was always why aren't people moving to the cities in larger number and accelerating financial uh, structural transformation. But uh, we didn't realize before uh, doing this work how important this immobility was in the US. And when you start thinking about it, there are many reasons why people will not move. One is that the, the real estate where the jobs are is so incredibly expensive that in fact the standard of living are not that much higher. The other is that they're often, when there is an economic shock in a place, people are often underwater on their mortgage, so they cannot really sell the house, at least they have a house if they stay where they are. Another one is childcare where the social, the community around them, their parents, etc., is providing childcare and moving is, uh, you would lose that. And more generally, the social network. Uh, there is now a lot of work on social networks in economics, which maybe has rediscovered the obvious thing, that we are social creatures. We like to have a position in a network. We derive a lot of utility from that. And losing that to start a, a, a new, in a new location is simply extremely difficult. It's real pain. And the final thing that I will come back to in conclusion is that people would want much more from their job than just money. All of the polls suggest that what people look from their job is some sense of meaning. They want to do some meaningful job. Not everybody gets to do a meaningful job, but people who have been in a job for a long time and have you know, gone through the ranks are more likely to uh, think that their job carries some uh, meaning and gives them some status and some dignity. And moving to get, you know, to start afresh in another place doesn't give you back the job that you had in the first place. So when there is a big economic shock, people aren't necessarily super excited. We're moving from making furniture in North Carolina to selling furniture in New York. The third lesson is that, and that might be related to this role of, of, of dignity, is that in, in economics, we tend to uh, take people's preferences as given and not dis, dis, dispute them or dis, uh, discuss them. So this, uh, the gustibus is the, comes from this saying, the gustibus non, non est disputandum, 
And a very kind of strong tenet of neoclassical economics is that we should not discuss tastes. We should take preferences as given, assume that people have them, that they are not affected by your social network or your community or by what you ate for breakfast or how things change, that they are strongly held. And that what we should study is given this set of preferences, how are people reacting to change in their economic environment? But in fact, all of the uh, work in behavioral economics and uh, sociology and social network literature suggests that people's preferences are actually not that strongly held often. And again, they, we are affected by what other people think. We kind of want to imitate our friends, not just to imitate them for the sake of imitating them, but because we get persuaded that they have the right preferences. And even our sense of who we are and our identity that sometimes feels like something unavoidable can actually be affected by not very much. So I'll give you an, just one example of that, uh, which is a funny experiment that was done with uh, Swiss bankers. So the Swiss bankers were brought into a lab in Switzerland. That's why they were Swiss bankers. <laughs> and uh, they were asked to uh, throw a coin a number of times. And they were paid as a function of the number of times the coin lands on the tail. Nobody watches them. So obviously, if you feel so inclined, you can cheat. In fact, it's funny because in subsequent experiments, people have actually filmed them unbeknownst to the subject. And when people want to cheat, they don't just write down the answer. They throw the coin until it lands on tail which is kind of endearing to show that you know, they are kind of making an effort to get the right answer. In any case, they got this Swiss banker, and they first asked them to uh, reminisce about uh, their weekend for one group of bankers, or about uh, their job for the other group of bankers. And they were randomly selected who was asked to reminisce about one versus the other. Then they asked them a series of questions about their values, including this question, uh, uh, do you agree with social status is primarily determined by financial success? And those who are asked to reminisce about their family are less likely to agree with the statement than those who think that, uh, uh, they, that those who were asked to reminisce about their job as bankers. So just kind of thinking about yourself in a different way change how you report, uh, what you report is important. More importantly, it also changed how they behave throwing the coins. So the bankers that were asked to think of themselves as bankers are much more likely to cheat on the coin game than the bankers who were asked to think of themselves as family men. In other words, there is, in fact, the family, the one whose identity as family men were activated do not cheat. So in other words, there is not something like deeply different about the bankers in this experiment. Uh, the way that you think about yourself affects both what you believe at this moment in time and how you behave. And that success that our identity, our very identity is something much uh, more manipulable than, uh, than we think it is. The first lesson uh, and is that there is an exception to this uh, fairly fleeting uh, aspect of preferences. And it's that uh, people at all level in life deeply care about what we call dignity in the book. Uh, so one reason why uh, the very, even the very rich are not, sensitive, not very sensitive to even high uh, in financial incentives, say, in the form of taxes, is because what is most important is to be richer than your friend. And the level at some level doesn't matter anymore. So they want to earn more money than their friends, but if everybody else earns less money, then that's fine. You just all on the same ranking patterns. Similarly, uh, people need uh, to, uh, to derive, as you were saying, meaning from your job. And the meaning from your job, from the, meaning, from the meaningfulness of your job comes the dignity. And that means that losing a job, for example, can have a very large impact on people's dignity, especially in a society like ours where we don't look very favorably upon people who are coming through hard times. 
we have a kind of uh, can-do uh, uh, attitude, which suggests that if someone is not able to pick up by their bootstrap and move somewhere else, somehow it is a little bit their fault. And the consequence of that is that because it is, in fact, very hard for people to move for the reason we were discussing before, when a shock hits, and it hits people in their sense of self because they lost the job that they had for a very long time, and the social protection system, instead of sort of compensating them, makes them feel kind of suspicious uh, because there is no uh, direct compensation for having lost your job due to trade. There is actually a very small program, but it's tiny, tiny, and most people haven't been able to access it. So the way that most people survive when they lost their job to, tr to trade is to go on disability, which, for, which is difficult to do because it, uh, it, you have to jump through hoops to show that you're disabled. And in, in addition, if you succeed, it sort of adds insult to injury to say, well, you, know, you are kind of disabled, you're not even able to work, etc. And the result of that is that those kind of localized shocks uh, that coming from trade, coming from automation, the way we think of them as, as economists is that, oh, it's a little bit costly for the low-wage workers, but it's only after all of the adjustments are made. But the reality is that it's not the average impersonal worker that suffers it. One person who is directly hit and is not able to go back, or it's one community, because in a lot of cases, those, those jobs are very clustered. So it's an entire community where everybody gets hurt at the same time, including the people who were working in restaurants, et cetera, because nobody has money to, to buy things in restaurants anymore, which is why you see those kind of shuttered community. And those have consequences which are much, go much further than the economics alone. One of the clearest ways to see that is that the places that have been the most hit by the trade shocks have suffered from a, a kind of an erosion in social and family values, so people are less likely to marry, they are more likely to have children out of wedlock, and they are simply more likely to die. And in particular, they are more likely to die of what uh, Ankes and Angus Deaton called the death of despair, which are opioid overdose, suicide, uh, alcohol poisoning. So this is for the country as a whole, where you can see between 2000 and 2014, the huge increase in those deaths of despair all over the, over the countries, and in particular, in your part of the country, where it used to be much less than in the coast uh, in 2000, and now has completely darkened. So when we reach to a point, sometimes people tell me, well, but how do you quantify dignity, and can we really put it in our model? And when you see this map, you say, well, we better find a way of quantifying and putting it in our model, because it's killing people right there. In fact, there is a study showing that if someone who is, uh, people who are 50 plus losing their job due to displacement, so their company uh, shut down, are also more likely to die of a heart attack in the, in the coming month. So let me, uh, let me uh, stop there to leave time for questions. I'm just going to put four uh, kind of photos on the, on the board, flash for photos on the board to show you how these four lessons alone can help us think about uh, the core issues that we have to fight with. The first one, obviously, uh, is trade. Economists like to think of the gains from trade. We agree that there are gains from trade, but there are also pains from trade, and they need to be uh, integrated in our analysis of trade, and more importantly, in the policy making and taking very seriously the individual or localized cost of disruption is something that if we don't do, I don't think we can get away, from, come out on the right side of the crisis we are, we are in today. The second uh, is that uh, 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 there is no reason, as economists, to be scared of taxes. Uh, it's sometimes when, you know, if you follow a little bit the debate on the, on the wealth tax now, you have very you know, serious economists who say, oh, if you have a wealth tax, that's the end of capitalism as we know, him, know it. And the point is that it is not, because people are just not very responsive to taxation. So in reality, if we could have higher tax rate, it will not be the end of capitalism. It would not register on the economic, uh, on the economic uh, 
platform. In fact, the states like Kansas, which have tried to lower the taxes a lot, also it didn't register the other way. It didn't help them to grow. That doesn't mean it's something that is easy to do politically, because there is no, of course, huge demand for higher taxes. And there is, not, there is not enough government legitimacy to say, well, let's increase the taxes. Trust us, we're going to spend it, spend it well. So I don't know if it, it can be done politically. I think it would have to be done over a very long period of time and very mindfully. But the reality is that if we could do it politically, economics, economics would not be worse for the wear. The third one is that we can fight climate change. So even if that impose changing our behaviors. So often we think, well, the only way that we can do climate change, fight climate change, is if it turns out that the investment we are making now will make us both more productive and greener. And I don't know whether that's the case. It might not be the case. But uh, when you take into account the fact that people's preferences are not that strong, that also we are creatures of habits, then it's actually not, probably not that difficult to kind of get people used to a slightly different way of living their lives. And then it won't be costly anymore. The first and the, and the, the, and the last and, the, and penultimate lessons are related is we need to rethink our social protection system for the reason I explained during the talk. We have a social protection system that is still under a Victorian hangover. It was, this is a photo from a, a Victorian era in England of a poor house where people were literally punished for needing help. But we are still very much in that system, and our Victorian system got a bit of a booster shot during the Reagan era and the welfare queens and the like. And that is extreme. We need to replace that with a social protection system that puts dignity at the center of social protection. And that is essential both for the people who need help, who have been victims of shocks, but also for everybody else who is thinking about the day where they might be needing help because we live in societies that are full of disruption and who have been trained to think that anybody who needs help is a loser. Well, in fact, they are not. They are just kind of more the hero of our a collective uh, society, they're paying for the rest of us in their individual uh, body and lives. And I think we need to, unless we change people's view that it is possible to actually, if something happens to you in your job, you can, th there is going to be significant help for you to get back to your, uh, uh, get back on your feet. Not because uh, we are generous to you, but because this is the normal thing to do. Uh, then unless we do that, people are going to continue to be terrified of changes and to look backwards instead of look, looking forward and trying to uh, you know, solve together the, the, the challenges we will have to face. Thank you very much. Awesome. If you do have a question for Dr. Duflo, please use the microphones. There's in both aisles here. Um, if you line up there, she'll be able to hear your question a little bit better. So you talked about uh, incentives being like the main driver of what people do, and that's overrated. But wouldn't considering all those costs still be in that thought of incentives? Yeah, that's why I, I, I qualified what was written on the slide as financial incentives are overrated. If you define you know, self-interest broadly enough to include you, uh, your uh, uh, you know, desire for dignity and your uh, role in the social network, then of course uh, you can always define everything in terms of incentive. But uh, generally, uh, in economics model, it gets boiled down to people responding to just financial incentives. Um, you do a lot of research, you know, focusing on the United States and this new, like, bringing dignity back into the question. Um, with your other research, how do you see the difference of dignity playing into the lives of those who have been poor their entire lives versus um, facing economic hardship later on in their life and in a different state? That's a great question. So you might think that it's different because if people are very poor but everybody around them is also very poor, then it's kind of uh, not that hard. And in some respect, I think it is true. But in developing countries, also people find themselves in situations where they are robbed of their dignity. And one thing that is quite common across both poor countries and rich countries is the fact that the social protection system is designed as a set of hoops that are to be jumped to prevent leachers and sponges to take advantage of the system. And for the same reason, 
uh, that actually prevents a lot of people who would be eligible and would benefit from help to take advantage. So we're finding a little bit the same thing. And there is a, a wonderful program called uh, the, uh, by BRAC, a Bangladeshi NGO, which go to the absolute poorest people in their villages, in communities that are usually quite poor already, and take people who have who have no, who typically are not working, widows or a woman whose wife, whose husband is drinking or something like that, and they are like they have no dignity. People just give them alms or they are made or they and they don't think highly of themselves either. And what this program does is that it gives them an asset, uh, like two cows, for example, or some money to start a small uh, shop, and it helps them for about 18 months in taking care of that asset, and then goes. And that program has been shown to have long-term effect. We've now followed uh, the people in India for 10 years, and another team followed them in Bangladesh for 10 years. And you're seeing a complete divergence uh, in the lives of the people who got access to this program early on, even 10 years later. And part of it, of course, is the asset that helped them get back on their feet. But uh, I, another very important part of it is the fact that it made people realize that they can do it and gave them hope and gave them confidence in themselves. Um, Dr. Duflo, um, something that has been bothering me for a while, and I think you touched it on your research, is that um, we're talking about brain drains from migration. So you look at people like moving to London, and you have countries like as you were studying with England, India and Bangladesh, or Kansas, as you mentioned. How do you prevent people from leaving instead of staying and reinvesting in their communities? So I think that the, the, the research on the brain drain is actually a little bit more mixed than, uh, than you seem to suggest, and in particular, there is a lot of uh, gain from people coming and coming back. And now if you look for, uh, at India, for example, uh, a lot of people moved to the US, worked in the US for some time, and came back. And it is those people who started the uh, uh, software industry, and then the uh, back office processing industry, which turned out to be huge engine of economic growth in India and of employment for people. So in that sense, the brain drains also turned out to be brain gains. Uh, there was another example, for example, in Yugoslavia. At the end of the like, dismemberment of Yugoslavia, a lot of people went to Germany. And then they came back to wherever the country they're coming from. They, that was not Yugoslavia anymore, but the countries they were coming from. And uh, the more people had gone and come back, uh, the more the industries that they had worked in developed in, in those places. So there is also uh, kind of a, a, a positive uh, aspect of people living and uh, coming and going. And my sense of the literature is that on balance, it is more positive to have people living and coming back than to have people stuck in place. I want you to just touch on that slide about migration. I thought that was surprising to see, especially because it kind of goes against what I would consider the popular narrative of what technology and um, movement is like today. Yes. And I was wondering if that is because we don't necessarily understand the negative externalities tied to technology and what economics can play, how economics can uh, kind of change the perception or change the externalities that associated with technology. Uh, um, so I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question. Um, so uh, pardon me if I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure I understood where your question was going. But one form of the question could have been some uh, things are, uh, that I put on the slide seems super counterintuitive. So for example, that people are actually not moving, even though it would seem that it would be easier and easier to move. Uh, another thing that is counterintuitive in migration, for example, that I didn't touch on, but is also important, is that low-skilled workers, even vast, large influx of low-skilled workers, do not depress the wage of native low-skilled workers. And that's not me saying it. It's really the consensus of the economics profession. It goes against the grain in a very powerful way. Because our intuition that it has to be that more people lower wages. And in a way, it's kind of your intuition of, oh, the technology makes it so easier to move. So then what you have to do is to kind of unpack. Not only you give the facts, which is what we are trying to do in the book for migration, for international migration, but also you try and unpack why, where the basic logic is missing. So in the case of migration, for example, it's because we are forgetting that the migrants will come also eat. 
And in particular, they tend to consume a lot of services that are provided by low-skilled workers. And therefore, at, okay, there are more uh, workers who come, but there are also more consumers who come, and that kind of counterbalance. Another thing, and that's related to technology, is that so the, 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 the migrants don't typically replace the local workers because the local workers are embedded into complicated labor markets where there is relationships, etc. And it's not that people are going to replace them by someone who just arrived from Mexico or from India. So the migrants have only access to some pockets of the labor markets where native workers are not there. And if for a reason or another they are not here, they are not replaced by native workers, they are replaced by technology. So there was an example, very clear example of that in the 1960s, actually, which is when uh, Kennedy, uh, Boeing under pressure, decided to send back all the braceros who were uh, Mexican temporary migrants who were working on farms. And the idea was that uh, we need to send them back because that's going to create uh, wa increased wages and create employment for the native worker. So the, this program was removed. All of the uh, farm workers went to Mexico. They stopped coming. And nothing happened to the wage and the employment of the native farm worker. And in that case, what happened is that the farm owner mechanized. So they changed crop, and they moved to crop that were easier to mechanize. And within each crop, they kind of mechanized the crop as well. So for people, it's pretty difficult to understand what's the counterfactual. They see someone who has a job, and they see, well, it could be me. But the truth is that it couldn't be you, because you wouldn't take it at that wage, and the employer will prefer to mechanize instead of give it to you. So that's kind of a, a way in which sometimes our intuition gets wrong, even when they are very powerful. So in terms of climate change, you stated that preferences of people are not actually that strong as we may th thought they were. You also stated that economic incentives are also not as strong as we thought they were. So so how do we begin to address the environmentally, economically, or otherwise? Uh, so uh, one, there are other type of incentive as the other person. If we define incentive broadly enough, we'll always find one that works. And one that works pretty well is uh, social incentives. Uh, so for example, uh, there, there is a group, energy group, O Power, that is sending um, energy reports. We probably got them, because now everybody does that, to compare you to your neighbors to your most efficient neighbor and kind of shame us, for example. <laughs> I don't know about you, but because we always consume more than our neighbors. And um, so there was experiments showing that when people get these reports, they actually reduce their energy consumption. But then what is also interesting is when they stop getting the report, their energy consumption stays back down. So there is a social incentive, not a financial incentive, and then an effect of habit Part of it is mechanical, which is once you set your thermostat to, uh, far, uh, to Fahrenheit lower, then you don't put it back. Part of it is habits as well. Hello, uh, my question is related to the welfare trap. Um, more specifically, the common sentiment or the opinion is that when an indiv individual who is needy um, goes on welfare, then they have little incentive to um, sort of move out and uh, look for a low paying job. Um, to what extent is that actually true today? Uh, so I think that's not true, uh, and uh, I tried to show you some evidence that it was, uh, that it was not true uh, from this series of experiments in all over the, the world. Uh, one slide that I picked, uh, was that, that I, uh, the, it was also not true in the negative income tax experiment. One slide that I skipped, which is also informative there, is the Alaska uh, um, uh, Permanent Fund, where people get 4, 000, about $5,000 a household a year. And that has not had any impact on labor supply of the Alaskans. So I think that's on average not true. Uh, my question relates to your last slide, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, let's make it a, so you lose your job, and uh, we have a social safety net. Whether it's enough or not, let's not argue about that. But you know, you go on Medicaid, you can get welfare, all those other things. But the loss of dignity from losing your job is pretty. It's tough. Yeah. So what are your suggestions? to put the dignity back in, in this process of rebuilding your life when you don't have a job? Great question, <laughs> which we, uh, we spent basically our, our entire last chapter, which is on social policy in this world, is entirely devoted to that. 
So, it, uh, and it, so it's not one, it's a multi-pronged approach because we don't really believe in uh, silver bullets, but we have a number of silver pellets that we are proposing. Uh, one is actually there is a program uh, in the US called Trade Adjustment Assistance Program where people are not going on well, well if their company qualifies that their job was vanished because of a trade shock, they don't go on welfare, but they are given uh, uh, ex extended employment insurance plus uh, university credit for uh, uh, get, getting retrained. And that program was actually evaluated, and it's, it's very effective. Over, uh, it's easy to evaluate because it's so random the way that it's attributed now that people get it, some people don't get it, that are otherwise completely similar. And when you're comparing the one who get it for the first 10 years after losing their job, they, earn, they get a job quicker, they get a more highly, more paying, a more highly paying job, and they're they are earning more money over a period of 10 years after the shock. So one proposal, proposal we have in the book is to really expand both the generosity of this program and its coverage. So that's not welfare, that's trade adjustment assistance. So it changes the, the, the narrative. We, what, what we talk about in the book is that it should be modeled after the GI Bill, which is when someone comes from the war and they've lost whatever it is they were doing before, you don't consider they're a loser and they need help. You consider they're a hero and they need our gratitude. And for that, we give them time to go to university and, and university credit, which are quite more generous than the one in the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. So our view is that for any workers who, is, who want to do it, uh, the, the ability to have this program at the level of the GI Bill and probably uh, rhetorically called something like the GI Bill, so we call it the Veterans of Disruption Bill, and it could be for trade, it could be for uh, uh, being replaced by a robot, it could be for uh, uh, being replaced by fracking if you were doing coal. Uh, you, uh, you give them that program, not as welfare, but as uh, thank you from society and help to get back. You so that's, that that's, that's one example, but you really will have, to, have to think about the whole thing because this program would not work for everyone. You have to think of something else for older workers. You have to think about creating jobs in society that are not going to be replaced by robots, uh, which is another area that the government can work on. Not welfare, just you know, have a lot of good jobs in childcare, in elderly care, in education that people can have as career once they are retrained. Do you think that technology has a role in retraining in that regard? For example, I was talked to someone the other day who are down south, they're using augmented reality to discern initial training attempts rather than send you to, to a, a, a Votex school for six months and figure out it's not what you do well. Do you think there's a technology play in this idea of retraining and coaching? There could be, and uh, I don't know, but one, it's certainly worth trying. Uh, but it, this is precisely the conversations we should have. Because once we agree on the principle, we can go to you know, what I call, uh, with a lot of fondness, the plumbing, which is how you get it done. And then it could be that. Uh, but first, we'd have to agree that this is what we hope to do. So a lot of people obsess over GDP and GDP per capita as you know, measures of quality of life. But it misses lots of things, like life expectancy and access to health care and you know, the amount of pollution in one's environment. So what do you think is a more effective way to evaluate and measure a person's dignity? So uh, I couldn't agree more that, I think that's what's kind of what we were implying, that uh, I couldn't agree more that we need to go beyond GDP. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a huge for one for index, so I don't see the, the value necessarily of putting the rest in an index, but you just named a few things. I think a country where Mortality, has, of all cause, mortality has gone up for three years in a row, which is our country, is clearly doing something wrong, even if GDP goes up. So clearly, mortality, infant mortality, education, etc., goes into the index. That's true for poor country and for rich country. And I'll tell you something else. There is another value in focusing on these measures and not just GDP, is that it turns out GDP is not really under the control of policymakers. <laughs> we don't really know how to affect it in the short run or even in the medium run first order. So uh, focusing on these other issues is actually when not only to uh, uh, reflect more accurately what is quality of life, 
but also focus on things that you can actually affect uh, but with better policy. And we, we are making this argument in, in the book. Thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Duclos for the presentation.